Hello and welcome to another edition of Mailbag on this fine Sunday. I am not Christian Harloff or Dennis Zhang. I am Riley, Mark Riley. How you doing? So good to be here. We are taking your questions that you send to collidervideo at gmail.com. We take them, we talk about them, we get sweaty, we get geeky, we talk all movie things. So glad to have you here. And uh, joining us, ladies first, we have Sinead DeFries. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah. Happy Sunday, everybody. Happy Sunday, indeed. And look at that. Over there, we got John Schnepp. Mm, oh, it's a Sunday, Sunday, <laughs> Sunday. Is it really Sunday? It could be if you're watching this on Sunday, so I guess it is Sunday. Hi, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It is Sunday, and we're so glad to get up early, because we did. We got up really early Man, I totally just got to up do this crack of dawn, <laughs> had some biscuits and gravy. Yeah. Yeah. Wanted to go back to sleep, but then decided to come in here with all of us early on Sunday to answer some mailbag questions. <laughs> so with that being said, let's get to the first mailbag question. Sinead, what do we got? All right. The first one comes from Renee. She writes, oh, hi, Collider crew. I recently saw the best bad movie, The Room. It is definitely one of the worst movies ever made, but I can't wait to watch it again. Borrowing a line from Ghost World for you, what movie is so bad it's good and what movie is so bad it's past good and back to bad again? Thanks and keep up the great work. You're my best friends. Oh, that's awesome. And The Room is some amazing cinema. If you haven't seen it, I recommend seeing it and uh, bring some popcorn, pop that movie in. It's ridiculously stupid, but I love it. Um, Mark, you're tearing me apart, Mark. <laughs> exactly. Oh, hi, Mark. Hi, How are Mark. you? I tear me apart. Yeah, it's amazing. I went and saw that uh, when they did the screening over at the Sunset Five. Yeah. So much fun. People were like, bring a bunch of spoons. I was yeah. like, hey, right? relax. I'm going to just watch the movie and watch other people throw spoons. Can I just experience this the way I want to? Exactly. So it's like, it's fun if you see it see the room with an audience an audience participation similar to rocky horror picture where they will yell out responses call and responses while you're watching the movie it becomes an interactive make fun of the film film exactly and that's kind of a really fun way to see it just watching it by yourself alone i don't know if i'd recommend the room because it's just uh you know it's not room with brie larson right the oscar winning you know uh this is the room yeah so it's a different kind of experience so i highly recommend if you can get to a theater where they're showing it that's the way to experience the room. Absolutely, but if we had to pick a movie that is so bad it's good, the first thing that came to my mind, Roadhouse, starring Ooh. Patrick Swayze. I watched that thing for the very first time. I was very little or very young. Watched it on VHS, I was like, this movie's kind of lame. And then I proceeded to watch it probably 87 more times Ooh. in the history of my life. I love that movie. It is so ridiculous. Dalton, come mm. on, yeah. the double deuce he takes on. Every bad guy there is that's in Hicktown. Yeah, it's they had so to fly funny. him in. He's a specialist. Yeah, I know. It, it's ridiculous. So I highly recommend Roadhouse. That's one I have. Shep, what about you? I, I love Roadhouse. Um, to me, it's not It's not so bad. It's good. To me, it still is in like, it's a good 80s movie. Sure, it's sure. It's like Laurie Singer's in it. It's got all the all the people from the 80s. Yeah. There's a lot of action and that fighting and that, you know, that stupidity that was just an action film of the 80s, yeah. a lower end action film. But sure. I'm going to rock the Apple it's Menahan Golan from Golan Globus Entertainment. It's the it's the musical he directed that should have never happened. Is it oh about my an God. apple? Oh no, it's not. It's about the New York Big Apple living in the apple and being a disco king <laughs> nice. and queen. It's so bad. It's uh it's almost unwatchable. Um, the other ones I would say that uh, are bad good are Battle Beyond the Stars. It's like a kind of a remake of the Magnificent Seven, but told via through Roger Corman's cheap lens. Oh, any of the Roger then, Corman, man. Yeah, then yeah. flipped out into science fiction, outer space, has George Papard as cowboy that's his name and nice. he gathers together like six other weirdos to fight this guy uh <laughs> uh i think it's i want to say robert vaughn it's not robert vaughn it's uh i'll get it in a second i'll look it up but it's it's perfect it has sybil danning in it it's an amazing 80s cheese fest i saw it when i was a little kid okay. i loved it you watch it now doesn't really hold up john boy <laughs> from the waltons is the main character he's the hero oh if that God. makes you feel weird about seeing it definitely see it because it's so bad it's good nice and shanae what do you got all right, mine's kind of cheating because um, parodies are meant to be bad. Sure. Right. But if I'm 100% honest, the first movie that came to my mind, just because of how many times I've seen it, is Scary Movie. Oh, and yeah. it's cheating, yes, because they know that they're sure. creating a pile of garbage. But that movie makes me laugh time and time again. I will still watch it to this day. I've seen it probably over 200 times. You know, Ridiculous. I can get behind Scary Movie, but one of the sequels, yeah. it was bad. I mean, there are bad spoof movies mm -hmm. and slapstick with the, movies. With a little hand. Let me mix those potatoes up. <laughs> yeah. Chris, Chris there was Elliott. like that Hunger oh. Games 
<laughs> my germs. <laughs> yeah. Um. That, I think I got to say the second movie was the one that really made me almost piss my pants laughing because it, really? it had an homage to The Ring or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. Instead yeah. of seeing that weird, you know, shaky cam film. Yeah. But it was a giant fat guy standing in like sh- next to a shaky chair. <laughs> and then he sat in it and then he spun around and then he threw up. And I remember I just started crying laughing. I literally was tears because it was so funny. Stupid nice. that it made me laugh. Uh, nice. John Saxon is the actor's name. Oh, who's John the Saxon. villain in Battle Beyond the Stars. Check that out. Nightmare on Elm Street, John Saxon, yes, right? John the, Sa- the father. The sheriff. Yeah, he can't the sheriff. seem to do a good job. Yep. I like Schnepp dropping the knowledge on these That's oldies right. but goodies. He helped burn little <laughs> Freddy. <laughs> All right, what's next? Smurf Dinosaur writes, Hi, Collider Crew. Greetings from London. I've been re-watching Lord of the Rings, extended editions, obviously, and have been amazed at how well the movie holds up 15 years on. I think it managed to find a nice balance between CGI and practical effects, use of miniatures and prosthetics that ground it in some sort of reality. My question is this. Does an over-reliance on CGI in a lot of the big movies today mean that they will quickly become dated as technology improves? And is there any hope that we'll ever see you guys do a Lord of the Rings commentary. Thanks for taking my question and keep up the good work. That's a good question. Uh, I think inevitably that these movies will get dated just as technology improves, but it's the way they do it. I think Lord of the Rings is a great example Mm -hmm. because he did a lot of practical stuff, so it kind of blends seamlessly with the CGI. But when you look at like something like The Phantom Menace, like the first episode, episode one, it's like dated because Lucas was so over-reliant on CGI that when you go back to it and you look at like say, I don't know, Force Awakens now or something with a little bit more CGI today, you notice the difference. So I, yeah, I think it's inevitable and it all comes down, in my opinion, the filmmakers, you know, picking and choosing what they use you know, using the best technology available to them so that sooner or later we don't have to go take us out of the movie. Mm-hmm. As for Lord of the Rings commentary, who knows? That's uh, we got to ask Dennis. But those are those are some long movies. So we, we would have to set aside, I don't know, like three days mm-hmm. just, yeah. to, just to do those. The only way to do a Lord of the Rings commentary yeah. is to do all three movies, extended editions, all at the same time. Go, go I'm all in, in for that, like 14 hours, yeah. crying, you can't sleep, you just, I, I gotta get to that 18 ending third one where it never ends, <laughs> the, the super extended edition, the tree people get their ending, everybody's happy. Yeah. You know what, um, I'm gonna say, bad CGI, I just wanna mention Scorpion King, I think it was oh, Scorpion yeah. King too, yeah. where they ran out of, even the, even though the effects were already dated, they ran out of time to actually finish the rock as the scorpion creature, so he didn't even have like a finished, like a texture map is what they call it. Nerds. I remember that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so he looked all like extra horrible. So <laughs> like even when the movie came out, it sucked. So it was dated the minute it was in the theater. I was like, wow, that's fucking sucky. And that was dated back then. Now you watch it like, what is this bizarre like Atari? Yeah. Yeah, like it's like a weird pixelized thing that I'm looking at. Makes Ray Harry, uh, Harry Housen, what, what, how yeah. do you pronounce his name? Ray Harry Housen. Harry Housen. One of the masters. One of the masters, um, yeah, it makes those movies look well, like. yeah, those movies is funny. Some of those like are really stand out, like Jason and the Argonauts still yeah. stands up, even though it's got the little skeletons. Sure. Just, just to know that that was made by a dude moving those little things around is fun Pretty to know. Pretty rad. Men in Black 2 is another one that like the graphics in it just suck. Yeah. Like, I don't know if they were like run overboard, like, well, let's just keep putting graphics in and they ran out of time. That's another another one but I'm glad you mentioned Phantom Menace because a movie that does hold up is The Matrix oh, the first absolutely. Matrix absolutely. made at the same time as the Phantom Menace like chucking a million graphics in there yep. the Matrix was like very reserved and they used practicals they used miniatures and they used CG and it was a perfect combination because the Wachowskis knew what they were doing so yeah they did I mean that's something that's like it, it, you know honestly you can watch a movie from the 80s that has no special effects in it it will hold up better than a movie that came out 10 years ago chock full of effects because effects are are dateable but actually film and real props and actors are not so. exactly you bring up a great point and back in those days there they didn't have a lot of cgi to use and so they're using practical effects and using spielberg is a master at this yeah. he's cutting around corners to to not show the shark because it's you know failing everywhere right. so he's letting you use your mind shanae what do you think do you have any examples <clears throat> i mean i definitely agree with you i think it is inevitable and yeah. i also agree with the fact that you can say um a movie 10 years ago will seem more dated than a movie without any special effects. That is so true. And I think that um, 
nowadays when you watch movies with special effects, most of the time they come off really cheesy and mm -hmm. that's a big bummer. Like that's a sure. huge bummer because it takes you out of the movie when you see practical and special effects or special effects that don't work. Practical effects is the way to go, I think, in terms of if you want to consider your movie to hold up 20, 30 years down the line. Absolutely. Oh, you know, I just thought of, from, from what you're saying, a great comparison is the the middle, not the 50s, The Thing, but John Carpenter's The Thing, which came great. out in 1981. Yep. And The Thing, which was a prequel, but came out in 2011, what holds up better is John Carpenter's The Thing, yeah. because it was all practically shot. It was shot in the studio. Everything feels like it's there, like you're lit, and I'm the weird creature, and I'm lit. Yeah. Everything feels real. The Thing movie that they did the remake for, or whatever you want to call it, prequel, they replaced all of the practical effects because they didn't shoot them right. right. They, had a, they had a group of people who didn't understand how to shoot latex. You have to just know how to shoot it. Otherwise, it does look fake, so they replaced it all with CG, which looked worse. Yeah. So it was one of those things where you watch both of those back to back, and one of them that came out almost 30 years later looks worse than the original. I so. think it's something that the human eye will always see something that is tangible that you can actually yeah. touch. You're talking about the uncanny valley. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. All right. What do we have next? Jago writes, hello, Collider-ers. I've watched the Naked Gun movies recently after many years and realized how much I enjoyed Leslie Nielsen and his sl silly slapstick and narration type of humor. Would like to hear your thoughts on these movies. Do you think do you think there is still a demand for these types of films? Also, do you know of any actor actress that can play the part of Frank? I think it's Dreb Drebin. 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 Yeah. Was thinking of a slightly toned down Jim Carrey. Thank you for taking my email. Wow, God, I you bring up Naked Gun. I think of immediately Airplane, where Frank Drebin, Leslie Nielsen got his start. Yep in this kind of humor. Same, uh, the, the Zucker brothers, they directed and mm -hmm. created Airplane. So, man, I love those movies, and unfortunately, I don't believe that there's a demand for them anymore. We had a golden age of these spoof uh, slapstick movies with Airplane, with The Naked Gun from the Files of Police Squad, and then we got these stupid movies that came out later where it was like a Twilight movie comes out, and then these idiots over here make the slapstick version, right. and it's dick jokes and fart jokes right. and that's it if you look at airplane and you look at the naked gun yeah it's slapstick but it is smart it is so creative it's so funny and frank drebin leslie nielsen was a genius in this field he was so funny i highly recommend starting with airplane i even love airplane 2 the yep. sequel that's the, that's the subtitle the sequel and then all the naked guns are amazing um who could be another frank drebin i think jim carrey I mean, he's a little too on the nose for me, for that right. humor. For me, I think of, when I think of Frank Drebin or Leslie Nielsen, he just, I mean, he's not playing a comedy. He's playing a straight drama, right. and that's why he's so funny. Um, so I don't know who could do it now. I mean, that, that's a good question. Schnepp, do you have any thoughts on who could play it now? I do. I want to also mention Leslie Nielsen. He got his start as a serious actor. Absolutely. He's in Forbidden Planet, yep. something really awesome, a sci-fi from the 50s to check out. And then he got really kind of well known as the you know the straight man in these the Zucker brother comedies. Yeah, yeah. I love the idea of uh, a new Frank Drebin. To me, could possibly be Danny McBride. Ooh, I great think you call. just go yeah. a different way. You don't try to cast a guy with gray hair or an older dude. You just, sure. And I was just thinking about different comic sensibilities yeah. and someone who could just be fun playing themselves mm -hmm. and also sort of the butt of the joke. Like he's really good in um, his HBO series. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 anybody? Anybody? Help, camera. I have no. Eastbound and down. Eastbound thank and you. down. Thank you. over there. Yeah. I just drew a mind blank. But Cody. man, Eastbound and down is one of the greatest comedy series ever. He's got a new one coming out called Vice Principals. I think oh, he's great. Right. And he's he's been in everything. He's in the new Alien Covenant. The guy's yeah. a great actor. I think he would be great in this taking on the the mantle of a Naked Gun. You uh, you brought you brought up Airplane. I thought here's a free idea. Airplane Transatlantic, make it a 13 hour Netflix series told in real time with an airplane full of comedians, like the top crop, all on board, and just like come up with some madness. I think that could be a really fun thing. Netflix, are you listening? Yeah. Because you just got some gold. Bam. I like Free, that. Free, son, take it. There you go. Sinead, do you have any examples? Um, well, actually, I've never seen Naked Gun. It's just slightly before I was born. All right, um, let's uh, let's cut the camera yeah, right I'm here. Sorry. Too young. Gun. Yeah, I'm can't. Sorry. This is out. I'm out yep. I'm sorry. When I think of uh, like slapstick um, movies from scary movie. from my from my generation, there you but go. even going back further, I think of like um, like Home Alone and and um, like yeah. Dumb and Dumber. Sure. Um, and like slapstick comedy is 
is supposed to be based on like action. Like yeah. that's that's what it's that's what the root of it is. So yeah. like the Twilight spoof stuff like that that sure it's based on like action or violent which is like the definition of slapstick but it's not very smart like no. you said. No. It's not smart. And like when I think of like Home Alone and how clever that movie was and how much it caught on because like every single scene there's so much going on. I agree with you too there is there isn't a very big demand for it, but I yeah. will say that slapstick comedies are some of my favorite movies to watch like on the weekends where I just like want to chill. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would love to see good slapstick comedies like make make a, make a, a, a comeback. A comeback. I, yes, I, thank I you. I second that. I yeah. would love to see a resurgence of slapstick. Also, I need to mention Peter Sellers and the Pink Panther. Oh, you yeah. get just yeah, any yeah. of those movies. Funny enough, my my uh, old high school teacher like tagged me on a video because we, we did Pink Panther in high school. Man, I forget how great it. Peter Sellers, genius. Yes. So anyways, let's move on. What's next? Stuart Fletcher writes, Howdy, Collider. I am loving all the new programming from Makuga's TV Talk to Clark Wolf's Nightmares and even the resurgence of the Schmodown. Nice. I've recently been trying to get into more horror movies because I think it's an underappreciated genre. I watched the original Insidious back when it came out and really disliked it. I found it cliche, paint by numbers, and just all around repetitive. Then I saw the second one, Insidious 2, which blew my frickin' mind. Immediately after watching it, I went back to the first and loved it on my second viewing. Has there ever been a sequel, prequel, in betweequel, or a spinoff that enhanced your viewing experience of the original? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. That's a good, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I hate to be unoriginal in Insidious 2, Weirdly enough, I saw Insidious 2 first. Oh, wow. And then liked it so much, went back and saw Insidious and thought that that was the superior movie. But um, I'm, I'm kind of drawing a blank. Shrinette, what do you have uh, as far as like a movie that you saw that, enhan that maybe enhanced the first uh, movie? It's a trump card. I'm going to hold on to it for one nice. second. I do want to mention Insidious. I saw the first one in order, and I, I felt it was like, I loved the first 30 minutes. Really, literally, there were a couple of jump scares in there that freaked me out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it got, once that little red demon showed up, yeah. Like, oh, my, like, yeah, that scared me when he was behind the person. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, what the hell? Yeah, you're so cool. Yeah, but then it, towards the end, he's like, you know, making something with little, little dolls and a little turn. He's like, I'm in the demon's world. Then it seemed goofy to me. <laughs> right. And he's fighting him and stuff. Or was that Insidious 2 when he's like in a room fighting the demon? I I think we, it's Insidious 2, but I'm not maybe sure. I can't, I can't remember. remember now. Yeah. But yeah, one of them got a little corny for me. All right, the one that I think works, the prequel that actually makes Raiders of the Lost Ark better is Temple of Doom. There you so go. So Temple of Doom actually takes place three years or four years before, before yeah. Raiders of the Lost Ark. So Indiana Jones has never seen the Ark of the Covenant. He's all just about fortune and glory. He's a little tougher. He's a little meaner. He doesn't, yep. he actually, he, you see him grow in character if you watch Temple of Doom first then Raiders of the Lost Ark, then Last Crusade. So bam, son, prequel it. Yeah, that's a good one. How about you, Sinead? Do you have any examples? Well, I will say, um, also to be unoriginal, that Insidious 2 gave me a greater appreciation for the franchise. Mm. Same with like the Conjuring franchise. Yeah. I racked my brain to think if there was any like sequel or prequel or whatever movie that came after the original that I found better than the first I, I couldn't think of one. It always like, every time I see a sequel, I'm always like, oh, okay, that was all right, or that was great, or that was awful, and I always end up liking the original better. Like, mm -hmm. I literally cannot think of one movie where I don't like the original the best. Yeah, I, I mean, I kinda need to probably turn in my geek card because I didn't say these movies off the top of my head, but Godfather 2, and Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, I was about to say Empire Strikes yeah. Back. You don't have to turn in your geek card. It's yeah. like, those are just the normal, I, like a lot of people love Everybody Star says Wars. It, right? A lot of people love Return of the Jedi. Everyone has their favorite. Mine sure. is Empire Strikes Back, Mine too. which was a sequel. And I just wanted to correct myself. Raiders of the Lost Ark is 1935. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, uh, Temple of Doom is 1935. Raiders is 1936. So it's a year before. Year before? Yeah. Okay. So, well, it set, sets them up pretty brilliantly. Yeah. And uh, like with Empire, a lot of people say Empire. You can go, you can watch that and then you can go back and watch A New Hope and go, wow, there's there's a lot that, to like, especially with Han Solo. Mm -hmm. I think you, the character Harrison Ford played. And then, of course, Godfather 2, which some people argue is the superior movie over Godfather. But... You might be with me, Sinead, on this. Godfather, to me, is still, the original is still the masterpiece. You know what's great? Um, they have it on HBO right now, but mm -hmm. if you've never seen The Godfather just cut together. Oh, I know. I want to see that. And then they put it chronologically yeah. where the, the young Robert De Niro Godfather, it's incredible. Because I it? love both of those movies, but to see them as one big four-hour amazing film, that's just fantastic. I would yeah. try that. 
Nice. All right. What do we have next? Steven writes, hey guys, I've been watching the show since Guardians of the Galaxy was first announced. My question is, which Disney movie in your mind has the best animation, 2D and 3D? For me personally, it's Tarzan. Everything in that movie is gorgeous to look at from the characters to the backgrounds. And in my opinion, it's one of the few movies that perfectly blends 2D and 3D animation. Thank you. Nice. Man, so many to think about. Mm -hmm. If we're going... 2D to start. I love Tarzan. I mm -hmm. did. I did love that, and I love that there are 3D animation elements in the 2D. You can kind of see it, and when Tarzan's swinging through the trees, pretty amazing. What I think about immediately with the 2D version that kind of utilized a lot of that 3D kind of um, uh, animation style was Beauty and the Beast. Because I remember that that scene where Belle and the Beast are dancing into the ballroom and they start the chandelier and they're right. sweeping around. That is some gorgeous animation, 3D animation in a 2D world. And for 3D, for me, I was blown away. I had to go by myself to see this, but the original How to Train Your Dragon, mm -hmm. oh my God, that animation uh, was gorgeous. Probably what made me love it so much was the story, but I had those 3D glasses on and when Hiccup takes uh, 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 toothless for the for a ride for the first time as most amazing sequence animation story music everything so schnapp what do you have well for a uh, 3d and disney i count pixar now because they're part of the disney family so toy story 3 is an incredible 3d 3d it's just like toy story toy story 2 and toy story 3 3D is the best in Toy Story 3. WALL-E is another incredible oh, yeah. 3D adventure. And The Incredibles is oh. just oh, fantastic, yeah. really fun, all 3D. Um, as far as 2D animation, I would go with Pinocchio, mm, which is nice. some of the most fluid and beautiful animation. All shot, on, obviously, if you know anything about animation, the early Disney films were all done on 24s, which is true. You know, what the eye sees shot on film is per second, 24 frames per second. Sure. And they would draw 24 drawings per second. And then later on in the you know, later 50s, 60s especially, they started shooting on 12s, yeah. which was half. And so the animation quality went down a little bit. The smoothness in Pinocchio and Sleeping Beauty and even uh, even their very first one, Snow White, really is still there. You can watch them now and they still hold up. But I think my favorite is Fantasia. Ooh, nice. Um, the Good reason call. it's my favorite is because it's not only just all these different uh, musical elements, it's almost like the very first music video kind of film, but it's also different styles of animation. Every single style that they did is just incredible and pushed it to the limit. So I love it. Nice. Uh, how about you, Sinead? Um, a couple that stand out to me, uh, first first of all, is The Lion King. Just oh, the, yeah. Totally. Just the opening just the opening scene where so all amazing. the animals coming together it's yeah. just like what you, what you hope animation should Absolutely. be it's just beautiful everything is so different everything looks different every animal looks different and then another one for me is finding nemo i love finding nemo i think it's absolutely gorgeous mm -hmm. um the incredibles is one of my favorite animated movies of all time side note and um the incredibles? how to train your yeah the <laughs> incredibles yeah. how to train your dragon is beautiful yeah. i've watched that also a handful of times i love that movie it's gorgeous so yeah as far as disney goes we're leaving out one of the uh, two which are now available jungle book the mm -hmm. most incredible 3d i think i've ever seen yeah with all these animals and the original jungle book which some of the greatest animated musical sequence bear necessities right. and the king of the jungle all those all those sequences with mowgli in the animated version and now the new version which is all 3d animated animals which I've never seen done as good as The Jungle Book. So yeah. it makes me, when you mention Lion King, I wanna see an all 3D version of that, yeah. but with no humans, just all 3D animals, but the way they got them talking now, it's like, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that good good points, I love those. So Sinead, what do we have next? Nathan writes, hey Collider crew, great job with the show. I watch it every day after I get home from school. I'm a big Marvel and DC fan and have seen some disappointing movies from both. If you were to recast some of the roles in disappointing DC Marvel movies, what would they be? Mine is Fantastic Four. Have the same cast but change Doctor Doom to Adam Driver and add in Namor the Submariner, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Thanks and keep up with the news. That's some good examples. Yeah, I was going to... Uh I was going to um, Fantastic Four as well, but the, the when they originally tried to do it at Fox, I would have recast pretty much everyone except Michael Chiklis. Is uh, is it right? Chik yeah, Chiklis. Yeah, Chiklis. Yep. And I I feel like it was the I said the gum that you get in uh, Mexico. Chiklis. Yeah, Chiklis. There yeah. you go. Um, but yeah, I would have I would have recast that. I don't have any one on the top of my mind, but somebody that jumps to mind 
was that abomination of Amazing Spider-Man 2, mm -hmm. Green Goblin. Mm -hmm. um, Dale DeHaan is an amazing, amazing actor. So I really can't fault him completely. It's the realization of the character that Mark Webb and maybe Sony was trying to do. I mean, he looked like a, you know, a steroided out, like, you know, David Bowie on a, on a glider. I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it. So, and I wanted the original Green Goblin. So when they cast, uh, what's his name? Cooper. Uh, everybody help oh, me out. Chris Cooper. Chris Cooper. Thank you. Yeah. Get him one scene and he dies. I right. was like, come on. That is a great Green, uh, green Goblin. So I would even say, take a, take a note, Marvel, because we're going to get Green Goblin sooner or later right. in this next rebooted Spider-Man. So... Uh, you should be taking some notes about that. But, Schnepp, you're better at this for the superhero movies. This right. is your sweatiness. Yeah. What do you got? Well, I was going to say for Fantastic Four, I got Reed Richards played by Brian Cranston. Ooh, I'm wow. aging it up a little bit. Wow, that's nice. Sue Storm, Charlize Theron. Mm -hmm. I got Ben Grimm being played by Jason Statham. <laughs> nice. And uh, like for Namor, I got Daniel Day Kim. Which yeah. they've already kind of thrown him in the in the in the pocket there for, to do it, but I think it, the, having Namor be Asian is really good. It's a great call. So yeah, I'd like yeah. to see that happen. I don't have anyone for Johnny Storm or off the top of my head. I was like, it could be any one of these younger in their twenties actors. Yeah, any one of them. Is, yeah. I think any like, a good actor, but I didn't really like. No, nobody jumped out to me, and nobody's jumped out to me for Doctor Doom yet. But you know. Yeah, you know, we'll come back to this. We've got years to think about it. We don't get to Marvel Phase Four, which will be the introduction of Fantastic Four. I think. I I think I you're right. So we'll see. Yeah, and it's and it's a good question, but it's also hard because I would say Marvel is pretty right on with their casting yeah, lately. They really um, are. Over the past, you know, since 2008 with Iron Man, we've been spot on <laughs> casting. Even I will say Terrence Howard as Rhodey in, in the original Iron Man, I thought he was fantastic. And it was just a little bit of a scuffle behind the scenes, right. which led to Don Cheadle, who you can't argue, he was fantastic he too. He still so. is. You know, he's great as Iron as he's, a War Machine. Yeah, he's great. But uh, yeah, it's a little hard to, I mean, I, I, I think you brought up Brian Cranston. He should have been Lex Luthor in all the new uh, DC universe, just yeah. period. So I don't know. But let's move on. What, what we got next? Jay Nicholas writes, Dear Nightmares and Mailbag, I'm not a huge fan of the horror genre, but I'm glad someone in the first episode mentioned the metal door slam in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That was me. Rock and roll. <laughs> that was a sh frightening scene. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. That image is permanently burned into my brain. On that note, films like Harsh Times, <laughs> Bully, The Hurt Locker, Menace to Society, Kids, and Boys Don't Cry depict horrific violence and brutality that transcends the normal scope of what we deem horror. Even the last Captain America movie had a couple scenes that made me cover my mouth like Scarlet Witch in shock. If motion pictures are supposed to be evocative, horror, or otherwise, what scenes still haunt your mind and still bring chills to your spine just thinking about them? Wow, such a great question. Mm -hmm. Immediately jumps to mind. Oh man, the accused uh, Jodie Foster. Mm. That scene in the bar where she is uh, raped is some of the worst in, in filmmaking brilliant filmmaking worst scenes I've ever seen mm -hmm. I had to I watched this later because I was a little on the younger side sure. and uh, I watched it later because everybody was talking about like you know she won an Oscar for it I believe um, and my god I had to turn I had to turn away it was so just brutal but I love the call outs to what Schnepp yeah we talked about it on uh, on Nightmares sure. um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre the original don't look at those remakes the original it might as well just been somebody rolling, capturing these th this leather face guy killing people. The metal door, it's, it's insane how he gets hit over the noggin and he starts just, I mean, it just freaks me out. And I go then later on in the movie where he comes out of the darkness, takes out the guy in the, ch Francis in the, in the, in the uh, wheelchair. Those are some horrible things. But you brought up some really, really great kids is another one that is just sure. so hard to watch. Casper. <clears throat> Again, we're talking about rape here. Oh, man. Uh, it's just in... Oh, I can't even get into it. Schnepp, what, what do you have? Well, you know, there's like some films I call suicide movies where, hey, if you're in a, if you're a bummed out person, don't watch this movie. <laughs> yeah. Requiem for a Dream is oh, just God, overall yeah. very brutal on so many levels. Like, it'll get to you with Ellen Bernstein, uh, you know, with the two old ladies crying on the... Oh, on the, yeah. It's just like... There's so many elements to that film that are just a bummer. Mm -hmm. um, it's a brutal film, but as far as like 
Uh, things that I, that's, that jumped out to me, like when I thought about this, I'll go back to the thing and that blood test where oh, yeah. everybody's tied up and Kurt Russell's like, I knew it was you, McKinney, or whatever. That's why I saved you for last. And he hits the blood. The blood jumps out. It's alive. And the dude's like shaking in the chair. <laughs> yeah. And everyone's like, get me away from him. <laughs> Just, I mean, the most intense. I remember seeing it. I was a, a teenager, maybe a teenager, almost a teenager when I saw it in the theater freaking loved it screaming we love special effects me and a pal of mine we went to see it and uh you know we got into an r-rated film it was great and that scene when that scene happened it was just so transfixed on the screen and just just it felt like if this happened that's how you'd be if you were strapped to a chair next to a, an alien creature bubbling and freaking out landing on the wall jumping just insanity i love that scene Watch that movie just to see how to pace a scene out. Yeah. As far as pacing and shot selection, it's a great horror scene. Uh, another uh, another movie that really builds up tension for me, not so much as a brutal scene, but Descent. It's oh, the yeah. Descent. Yeah. It's about those gals who are like, yeah. you know, cave dwellers and go into those little crunchy, crunchy, like, you know, that's like, if you're, you know, it, it'll make you so, uh, you know, claustrophobic watching these gals like, slim through a little tiny cave oh yeah that's crevice. a great example then you add mutant creatures that want to eat them come on <laughs> so what about you Sinead do you have any yeah when I think of like a movie that sends a chill down my spine um Samara climbing out of the TV is one oh, yeah. of the creepiest things ever. Yes. Um, just the way she looked and her her there's something I have like a thing with limbs and her limbs like cracking oh, yeah. on the mm, floor is yeah. disgusting. And then uh -huh. um, there's also like other scenes that I feel like I'll never forget and um, like the ear scene in Reservoir Dogs. Oh, yeah. good one, yeah. Just like. Horrifying. I just feel like I'll be 95 years old and still flash back to that mm -hmm. scene. With, the With razor that blade. Cop, Come on. Oh, yeah. See, kind of I stuff. just got chills just talking about it. And that's not necessarily like horror, but it's just disturbing. I was going to say a couple of runner ups were the original Conjuring. Like yeah. the sequence towards the end, there's a lot of stuff I don't want to give away if you haven't seen it, but yeah. that just had an element of fear and dread. And then once the reveal happened and there was a second reveal, it just literally very frightening and then one you know we've talked about a little bit on on nightmares martyrs it came out a few years ago oh yeah it's so adam it's you so like rough. this stuff yeah man yeah it's a rough film you know adam it's like that's one of those films i was watching and i was like man i, I don't know if i want to see i don't want i don't even know if i want to keep watching this but i forced myself to go all the way to the end and it's one of those brutal films which does have a message at the end when you get to it and it's it's uh, it's worth seeing if you're if you have it in you to get through it there you go this is some great examples also makes me Shanae when you said Reservoir Dogs I think of the Pulp Fiction scene where they're doing the the adrenaline oh, shot yeah. in the chest yeah. you're just and it's not graphic it's not anything it's the tension that you're mm -hmm. like you're waiting for that and you're like oh, oh, oh god and then totally yeah go see it all right last one let's do this Ben writes yo it's Ben Holmes why does Michael Bay get all the shit for those bad Transformers movies? He's not the writer. He didn't write those garbage scripts. So why exactly is he to blame? This applies to any bad movie. Surely it's the writer's fault, not the director's. <laughs> what's up, Ben Holmes? <laughs> Yo, Ben Holmes, what's up, Yo. man? Yo, it's Ben Holmes. Yo, I love this. Ben Holmes is on the screen right there. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to Transformers movies, I, I love this question because it is a total valid point. And... I, Schnepp's going to have a lot to say about this. I think, yeah, you, you have to blame. I wouldn't blame the writers to start. I would blame the studio for rushing a script, especially the second one, Revenge of the or, what is it, Revenge of the Fallen something or like something. The, the Transformers, Rise Revenge of, of the Fallen, Rise of whatever. It was it was because there was a writer strike. So what they did is they took a version of Revenge of the Fallen and they went sure and they gave it to Michael Bay. And what Michael Bay should have done is said, nope, this is garbage, let's hold off. I wanna make and direct something worthy of my time to do this, but they didn't. There's so many factors that come in, uh, into play with this. One, it's a billion dollar franchise, they gotta get it out, they have a release date to hit. Michael Bay is gonna do it, he's gonna do what he does best, and that's blow shit up. So, you can't, I mean, I'm not gonna completely blame the writers. I will sometimes, maybe it's a, they're phoning it in, I don't know, they're getting a paycheck. But I also think at the end of the day, it falls to the director. If they get a shit script, they should say something. So I don't know, but Schnepp, you're gonna have something to say about this, I wanna know. Yeah, you know what, I mean, there's a bunch of different writers on all of the Transformers movies, and there's one director on all of the Transformers movies. So if you think 
that all the Transformer movies are garbage and are horrible, then you have one person you can kind of hang your hat on if you absolutely hate all of those movies, and that's Michael Bay, because as a director of a feature film, you're working with not only a writer, the writers are in the television world have a lot more control as executive producers or slash creators right. over shows where they can sit in with the with uh, other writers and run the writers room. They sit in with the editors and the directors and kind of help shape the whole you know the whole process of the season of the film. There's a lot of different directors on different television shows, mm -hmm. so you can't really unless the one director did all of the episodes. It can't really you can't really say oh it's my show. It's like right. you know it's like it's a shared universe as as far as credit with uh, with a feature film usually if you have an auteur or someone who's a writer director they get a little bit more of that auteur credit or you have people like Michael Bay who are like guns for hire they're like hey I've came in through the commercial world I'm a commercial director what do you got you know I'm a mercenary you got some money I'm working on your film yeah that's the kind of that's not really it's very rudderless to a certain degree it's not like I pick these movies because you know I'm interested in science fiction or I love robot it's it's more like a giant corporation is like, how can this guy handle our franchise or our toys and make something out of it so that right. we can make money? Michael Bay knows how to do that. Transformers yeah. 4 made billions of dollars. Uh, tons of people actually love those movies, who especially, yeah, you know, I can't talk for all the Transformers fans or whatever, but I'm just saying well, there's enough people out there who went and saw those movies that they're making a fifth one and a sixth one and a seventh one. Shared so, universe. Yeah. Um, is Michael Bay, is it his fault? Yes and no. Yeah. He is the one who actually shapes those films. Mm -hmm. Everything, every single thing that's said that's yes, he has a part to do with that. Mm -hmm. The other people who have a part to do with it is the production company. Yep. You know who has nothing to do with it? The writers. Yeah. You can't blame the writers at all because once they hand a script in, they have zero control. Not even 1%, zero control. And usually their stuff is rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. You wouldn't even believe how many scripts that you think you know who the writer is, who they have nothing to do with it. Even though their name is still on the credit, there's been a group of like 10 people brought in to brush up all of the characters. Yep. They have script reads, they have ghost writers. Yep. So don't ever just think just because someone's name is on a, the credits of the script that they actually either, A, could have possibly written 100% of it and that's their script every single line or maybe everything's been rewritten completely and the only reason their name is on there is for credit because of the WGA. So there's everything from between those two polar you know the director is the one ultimately and the studio who take the blame for a shitty film yeah the great great explanation hey, do you have anything to add Sinead? i mean i agree with, i mean that's pretty much i agree with that i will say that um i i still to this day don't understand why he does get that much hate mm. um because i feel like he he gets a lot like people have been really mean to him over the past few yeah. years and it comes up a lot just working here with you guys um yeah. that we that people are always criticizing michael bay online you see it a lot um maybe because transformers started out so strong and people were gen genuinely disappointed mm -hmm. um but at the same time, the movie franchise is still working. Yeah. It's yeah. still making money. More than ever before. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like you can hate on someone as much. You can put all the blame on him. You can put some blame on him. But it's there's it's still making money. It, you're absolutely right. And I mean, I think uh, everyone out there in Schmoville and Schmoes know that know me and Schnapp, we've ranted sure. on Transformers on the very Schmoes No Show. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of, uh, I won't say credit, but I know we get callbacks saying they enjoyed that. I pull back a little bit on Michael Bay because 13 Hours was a fantastic movie, and I know he's capable of more. So when I give him shit, I want more from him because I thought Transformers Age of Extinction was the laziest filmmaking I've ever seen. I mean, just there was there was stuff that I was looking at. You can't at. even call it paint by numbers. It's yeah. like in a new category. But we don't want to go on a sec another rant. Let's not get the engine started. But exactly. what I will say is I pulled back on Michael Bay after Pain and Gain. Oh, yeah. I thoroughly yeah. enjoyed that film. I thought it was great. I thought his direction was spot on. Mm -hmm. And the guy is super talented. Don't forget about Bad Boys. I oh, mean, yeah, The Rock. There's a lot of The Rock. Yeah. I mean, there's so many films besides Transformers that that guy has hit it out of the park in yeah. a good way. So it's just whatever his bent is on Transformers 4, it just does not work with me at all. I'm not looking forward to seeing Transformers 5 unless I'm totally drunk with Mark Ellis and the whole crew, and that's how we're going to see it. So I think that's how we are going to say it. And that is it for Mailbag. Before we go, I want to mention we have an awesome Comic-Con contest happening over at Collider.com. 
what we did, I put the link in this description of the YouTube. Uh, what you do is you click on that link, you go to collider.com, you enter because you can win a trip to Comic-Con 2016, paid airfare, your passes, events, you get a hotel. I mean, my God, you are lucky if you get this thing. I've been to Comic-Con a number of years and it is so much fun, but man, it's so hard sometimes to find a room. It's, in, get, it's insanity now. You have to get into a lotto to get into another right? lotto to it's, maybe get a ticket. It's, it's insane. And so what we got going here is we're like, you don't have to worry about that. Here you go. Click on the link in the YouTube description. Go on over to Collider.com. We got some amazing writers over there as well. Stick around, read some of their content. There's some amazing stuff there. And uh, maybe we'll see you at Comic-Con 2006. 2016. Yeah. My God. I just, Next month. I just dropped 10 years on us. <laughs> All right. Anyways, before uh, after we're going to go now. Uh, Shanae, where can the good people find you? I'm online at Shanae DeFries on everything and at that's Shanae.com. On Mondays, I'm hosting Collider TV Talk. On Fridays, Movie Talk and Mailbag over the weekends. Nice. Yeah. And how about you, John Schnepp? Uh, you can find me just on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You can check out my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened. We just put up a bunch of the last of the variant covers. Check it out online. You can see it at tdoslwh.com. Nice. And you'll see me on Nightmares and also uh, my show Heroes, which is on Collider. Heroes is on Wednesday nights or Wednesday during the, you know, we, whenever it pops up at five. Because <laughs> we do Nightmares now on Tuesday. And I'm rocking on a Movie Talk Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I'll see you there. There you go. And I am at Riley around on Twitter and Instagram. You can see me every Thursday on the Schmoes No Main Show. You can also see me with Schnepp on Collider Nightmares will be coming up this Tuesday with Clark Wolf and Perry Nemiroff. And then you can also see me uh, trying to uh, defend my belt in the Schmodown. We're trying to figure out a time for me and Dan Merrill to do the show, uh, but we are going to we're going to head head to head match on this nice. title contention. That's going to be a tough one. Dan Merrill is tough, but I look forward to it. So guys, we will see you next time. Make sure you subscribe to this channel, Collider Video. Give us a like on this video and check out all our other ones. Movie Talk, Collider Nightmares, Collider Jedi Council, Heroes, Mailbag. We have so much going on. Stick around and check it out and we'll see you next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.